Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be dividing my time with my friend, uh, the Member of Parliament for Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker, it's with great honour that I rise today to speak in this House on the budget delivered by the Minister of Finance last Thursday. Economic Action Plan 2013 builds upon the work from previous budgets and the government's impressive track record guiding Canada through the worst global economic slowdown. And now we're in a leadership position amongst countries of the G8. The focus of the 2013 budget is clearly upon jobs for Canadians. And I'll speak to that in my remarks, Mr. Speaker. It is about leveraging the jobs we have now in Canada through our leadership in financial services, resource development, and technological innovation. It is also about securing the jobs of the future and reorienting our skills training and lifelong learning programs to ensure we provide Canadians with the tools they need to maintain our strong position in the world. Finally, Economic Action Plan 2013 makes key investments in areas of priority for Canadians, families, seniors, veterans, and our First Nations. These investments are important and are being made in a budget premised upon two fundamental principles. First, this government's laser-like focus on getting Canada back to a balanced budget by 2015. This is to ensure we maintain our quality of life and maintain one of the strongest credit ratings in the world for the purposes of financing our debt. And second, the critical commitment we make to seniors and families across Canada to balance our budget without resorting to raising taxes. At a time when government revenues are somewhat flat, these two fundamental principles are not easy, Mr. Speaker. The opposition suggests billions in new spending on almost a weekly basis. The leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition has suggested that the government should not stick to our timeline of balancing the budget. Mere days before the budget, he went to New York to tell the business press that he would raise taxes on Canadian employers if the NDP were in power. And following the release of the Economic Action Plan 2013, which was very careful to maintain core entitlement program spending and increase transfers to the provinces and territories, the NDP leader said, I quote, you cannot austere your way out of a crisis, end quote. The NDP leader's cute turn of phrase and commitment to runaway spending and higher taxes reminds me of the Winston Churchill quote, that compares a nation trying to tax its way into prosperity to a man standing in a bucket trying to lift himself up by pulling the handle. Mr. Speaker, the challenging global economy and shifting labour realities requires the type of strong leadership that our Prime Minister has shown from the doldrums of the global economic recession to the present day. Economic Action Plan 2013 is about setting priorities that will maintain a focus on jobs for Canadians and a plan to ensure our prosperity for decades to come. Mr. Speaker, our government is proud of its record of 950,000 net new jobs having been created since the depths of the recession in 2009. This leads the G8 nations and has helped maintain our quality of life when other areas of the world are in turmoil. Our government is, however, committed to a relentless pursuit of higher employment particularly for young Canadians, Aboriginal Canadians, and areas of the country experiencing a higher than average rate of unemployment. Accordingly, I would like to speak on three key areas of Economic Action Plan 2013 premised upon securing jobs for Canadians. The first area is the government's, is the government's innovative approach to filling the skills gap in Canada, while also helping transitional in industries retrain and re-equip their workforce. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business in their 2012 statistics indicate that 34% of small to medium-sized businesses face a skilled labour shortage. This means that while some Canadians are having a hard time finding a job, some Canadian employers are having a hard time filling a job. Finding a solution to marry these two aspects of our economy should be the overarching public policy goal of any government, Mr. Speaker, and our government is making that the top priority. 
The Canada Job Grant will address the skills shortage in Canada by assisting up to 130,000 Canadians each year with short duration training for the workforce. The 5,000 per person grant has the multiplier effect two times over, up to 15,000 with our provincial and employer partners. The Canada Job Grant will allow employers facing skill shortages or training facilitators in the industry to work with both the federal and provincial governments on a solution that will help them increase their productivity while also helping more Canadians find long-term employment. The skills deficit in the marketplace is the true determinant of where skills training investment needs to go. And this will allow the federal government to negotiate transformative labour market agreements with the provinces and territories. Our government recognizes that the largest skill shortage in Canada is in the skilled trades and in the engineering and mathematics fields across the country. Economic Action Plan 2013 will work towards reducing barriers on apprentice accreditation and support the use of apprentices in all areas of national procurement and investment. The government is also earmarking $19 million to promote engineering sciences and mathematics to young Canadians in an effort to help young people fill these critical roles in our economy. Outstanding schools like the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, which serves my riding of Durham, have world-class programs in these core areas that will help our young men and women find engaging employment right out of school. Finally, the government is committing $241 million to ensure that young Aboriginal Canadians have access to skills training to assist in raising, un raising employment levels on reserve through re realignment of the income assistance program. I had the pleasure of joining 200 other Canadians on the Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference last summer, mere months before my election to Parliament. It was an excellent opportunity to see some of the policy challenges facing our country. I was part of a group of 17 Canadians that toured the province of Alberta, meeting with business, political, social and Aboriginal leaders. Every community we visited and almost every leader we spoke to described the labour shortage in Alberta as one of the most pressing issues facing the province. Indeed, it was placed as one of our key findings in our Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference group. The economic opportunity in Alberta is a tremendous benefit to all Canadians. And meeting the challenges this opportunity poses must engage all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, the second key area I would like to highlight from Economic Action Plan 2013 is the Building Canada Plan. I think nothing underscores the ability for this government to set priorities to secure our long-term prosperity better than this element of the budget. In fact, I'd recommend page 171 of the budget to my colleagues to see this impressive plan represented visually. The Building Canada Plan is an ambitious 53 billion 10-year plan to secure and enhance our nation's critical infrastructure and establish predictable long-term partnerships with the provincial and municipal governments across Canada. The Building Canada Fund will inject 14 billion into our economy in priority infrastructure projects with a national, provincial or local significance. First Nation infrastructure is part of the Building Canada Plan and will see $155 million directed towards critical energy road and bridge and civic infrastructure alongside investment in broadband connectivity to complement economic development efforts on reserve. Once again, the relentless focus on jobs and supporting skilled trades in Canada is built right into the Building Canada Plan. As part of its consultation and planning with other levels of government, the federal government will directly encourage the use of apprentices in projects receiving federal funding. The third area I want to touch briefly in Economic Action Plan 2013 provides for small business in the manufacturing sector in Ontario. On the same day that our finance minister delivered the budget, the Scugog Chamber of Commerce in my riding celebrated their Business of the Year awards. Small businesses are often the foundation of our local economies and have been an important focus of our government. We have kept taxes low for these businesses for many years and we have assisted with the difficult challenge of whether to hire one more person or not through the Small Business Hiring Credit. This budget expands this hiring credit by providing up to $1,000 against the rise in EI premiums as a result of hiring a new person. We're also increasing the lifetime capital gains exemption to $800,000, which will also directly benefit small business owners. 
While our government has shown its support for small businesses in Canada, I'd like to take this occasion, Mr. Speaker, to salute Kenna Kozak from the Scugog Chamber of Commerce, Sheila Hall from the Clarington Board of Trade, and Angela Horn from the Uxbridge Chamber of Commerce. These organizations in Durham and others like them across the country are the lifeblood of the small business community. They not only raise important policy issues to our government, they also serve to connect small businesses in a way to one another. Finally, Mr. Speaker, manufacturers also benefit in Southern Ontario with our government's $1.4 billion towards an accelerated capital cost allowance extension. Order. Order. I think we've reached the end of the uh, time allowed for the Honourable Member's uh, comments. We're going to go then to questions and comments. Question commentaire. Uh, the Honourable Member from Montmorency Charlebourg, au Côte Nord. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2006, the Conservative government has increased the debt by $167 billion. Is that good financial and fiscal management? Uh, the Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to, to thank my colleague for identifying exactly the, the, uh, the balance our government is trying to set. Um, it would be much easier for a government to impose cuts in the way the Liberal Party did in the mid-90s, Mr. Speaker, by si simply slashing national defense and slashing uh, transfers to our provincial partners. The government has tried to uh, stay on a pragmatic course, and I, I direct the honourable member to this course, which set 2015 as a goal for balanced budgets, but also along the way made strategic investments in, in infrastructure, in skills training, as a way of softening the impact of the global economic downturn on Canada. And I would say, Mr. Speaker, the results speak for themselves with Canada's leadership of the G8. Questions and comments. For Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's um, interesting when the government of Canada tries to give the impression that they really understand deficits, uh, Mr. Speaker, and deficit projections. In reality, when the Conservative government formed government uh, a few years back, they were actually handed a surplus, millions of dollars of surplus, and then they turned that into a deficit even pre-recession times, according to the Prime Minister. We weren't even in a recession. Yet they turned that surplus into a deficit. And then since then, we've had the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister contradict each other in terms of whether or not they're going to be able to have a surplus or a balanced budget and so forth. The question I have for the member is, why should Canadians give any credibility whatsoever to this government claiming that it's going to be able to have a balanced budget in 2015, which happens to be an election year, I must say, Mr. Speaker. Where's the, there is a credibility issue here, and I'm wondering if the member might provide comment on that. The Honourable Member for Durham. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to, to thank my friend for the question, uh, particularly since he is from uh, the Liberal caucus that I highlighted earlier. Uh, their government's approach to, to balancing the federal government was essentially through uh, passing along the challenges of a changing economy to provincial partners. A, re a massive reduction in transfer to the provinces, Mr. Speaker, that left provincial premiers, uh, whether NDP in, in Saskatchewan or progressive conservative in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, to be the real people cutting for the federal government. Um, at the same time, the, the honourable member would know that the government of the day also took advantage of an EI surplus that, ha that had grown uh, to help them in a way that really wasn't uh, a revenue stream that they should have been taking. And one of the key things our government recognized, Mr. Speaker, when we came to office was the fact that Canadians, particularly seniors and families, were overtaxed. And so the Prime Minister made it his objective to, to lower those taxes, both through a reduction of the GST and reductions across the board, and I think Canadians have appreciated that, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for the great uh, speech he gave in terms of uh, highlighting some of the great initiatives of this budget. Uh, one of the things he commented on, Mr. Speaker, was the uh, Building Canada Fund. And over the weekend, I had the opportunity to visit my riding, as many of us did, and uh, spoke to a number of municipal politicians and bureaucrats there. And, and to a person, uh, they were thrilled with the investment that our government is making in infrastructure. And I think the thing that 
primarily excites them is the fact that not only has the gas tax been made permanent a number of years back, but this year we're committed to indexing those gas tax dollars. In addition to that, large dollars for major infrastructure programs within their municipalities and across Canada. And I'm wondering if my colleague would care to comment on the kind of feedback he must be getting from his riding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Durham, a short response, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for highlighting, uh, unfortunately, one of the portions of the Building Canada plan that, uh, that I didn't have time to speak upon uh, in particular, uh, which is really partnering with the municipalities. Uh, instead of the, the previous government's penchant for multiple announcements and no action, this has truly been a partnership with the municipal level of government across the country, not only in a sharing of the gas tax, and as my learned colleague has just recognized, that will be indexed going forward, but also an important GST rebate, Mr. Speaker, that will actually help uh, municipalities, large and small, in all regions of this country, finance and be, in, uh, be a strong partner in our uh, economic action plan, in particular on uh, the Building Canada Plan and Infrastructure. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for